Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. Deadline say has been all along. Exam for three, which covers part three, our good dead friends uh, John Locke and Bishop Barkley. And uh, exam four, which covers our good dead friends David Hume and Emmanuel Kant. And quizzes part four, covering in our good dead friends uh, Kant and Hume. Deadline Friday, April 24th at end of day, 11.59, p.m. Exam number five, which covers all the stuff, deadlines on April 30th at noon. And again, for the quizzes, the best 10, regardless of where they come from in the course, that count, they're 30%. For the exams, best 4 out of 5, and they're 40%. And for the paper, it's the best paper out of the paper. The full credit deadline is today, April 21st, at end of day, you know, Blackboard, 11 to 9 to 9 p.m. If you already turn it for the plus 5 bonus, you don't have to turn it again, because uh, you have to turn it in once. The half credit deadline is Friday, April 24th at end of day. And I'll have the ones uh, turned in today. I'll start writing during office hours today, unless you know people come by and talk about <laughs> stuff. And the plan is to have them completed by tomorrow. And so you'll be able to see your grade then. Now to see how you're doing in the class, like what you'd get if you just stop doing stuff, you know, fire up your web browser, head to Blackboard, look at the overall grade column, and that shows you your worst case grade. And it includes the following stuff. Firstly, anything you haven't done yet treats as a hypothetical zero. So that's the worst case part. Also, it's already you know, dropping or keeping, depending on how you look at it, the you know, best scores, 10 best quizzes, best four exams, and the paper. And if you haven't got you know, all the exams done or you know, paper, et cetera, then the greater work kind of that. But it updates in real time. So as soon as you do something, you go and you know, refresh your browser, check to see what your grade is. Now, because of that, because the best um, you know, four exams out of five count, once you've done the four exams, the paper is all the quizzes you cater to, and you look up your overall grade and satisfactory, you can elect to not take the comprehensive final. Because you would have taken four exams covering everything, and the final is basically there is that in case one of the other exams didn't go so well. But before pressing on to the new stuff, which is looking at more Immanuel Kant, talking about his stuff, looking at the transcendent method, anything about the stuff to be, or the stuff that has been, that requires more stuff. Okay, so last time we're looking at our good dead friend Immanuel Kant, and his views on the analytic a priori, the analytic a posteriori, the synthetic a posteriori, the synthetic a priori, etc. And then we turn to his famous or infamous transcendent method. Now here's a basic idea. One of the things that inspired Kant, at least according to him, was reading David Hume. And he said that reading Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers, and as a professor of mine said, so that way he'd be dogmatic when he was awake. Now, the empiricist ran to the following problem, which is laid out pretty clearly by Hume. Namely, you have to go from you know, specific facts, you know, things you've observed, to generalizations. And Hume noted what we now call the problem of induction. Specifically, with an inductive generalization, one of the problems is, it's a basic problem in inductive logic. Whenever you're going from what you've observed to what you haven't observed, there's always a problem with that inductive leap, that you can't be sure that what you haven't observed is like what you have observed. And that happens in things like, well, obviously like in the sciences, you know, people do observations, you know, or say like a clinical trial, and the drug goes out of the general population, and you might get unexpected results, because even though nothing went wrong in your trials, your whole population could differ in important ways, ways that may result in illness or death. Or to use an example from politics, you might have someone who po polls very well, say, in the polls, but then when the actual election rolls around, the results don't hold the same. And of course, the difference is you, when you're polling, you've got your sample, and then when you've got the whole population voting, there could be some important differences. Now, in terms of how this impacts you know, the philosophical stuff, here's the problem. 
Hume noted that the limits of experience will always entail that our generalizations are uncertain. And this had all kinds of implications. So I mean, take, for example, the most classic case, causal reasoning. One thing happens, another thing happens, then that happens a lot. Then we become habituated to claims into expecting, you know, B is followed A over and over again. We expect B to follow A. But of course, we can never be certain that the next time A occurs, B will occur, because we're just generalizing. You know, B's have always followed A's, A's occurred, B will occur. But we could be wrong. And so we're ever, forever uncertain. Now, so Kant concludes that method, that approach, can never establish universal and necessary truths. And he's right. No matter how many times you observe something, you never actually see the necessity. And so the next time, it could be a terrible surprise. And that does happen. I mean, life is full of terrible surprises. So Kant, how's he going to get around that? Well, he develops what is called the transcendent method. And the idea is this. He begins with the nature of experience in general, and he thinks this can yield the conditions, the necessary conditions, for that possibility. So basically what he reasons is like this. What he calls the transcendent structures of experience are the formal features that aren't limited to any particular experience, but, he claims, are universal and necessary features of all experiences. To be a little clearer about it, here's kind of the way you'd sort out. Your question was, okay, so what the heck is he talking about? What is this, you know, stuff? Well, here's his test. Take an experience. Now, if you cannot imagine that experience without a certain structural feature, that, he claims, yields a reason to believe that that feature is necessary for that experience, such that you could not have that experience without that feature. Two examples. If we can make spatial judgments about our experience, and that'd be like, you know, to use a simple example, that the water bottle is, um, say, two and a half feet, no, well, three feet, actually a little more, three feet from me. Well, in that case, I can make a spatial, I can make spatial adjustments. The object's there, the wall's back there. My experience has got to have spatial experience. It's got to be space, possibly space madness, <laughs> which would be a whole other sort of experience. Similarly with causal judgments. When I, when I reason that <clears throat> one thing causes another, I've got to have an element of my experiences that orders or structures them causally. So my experience has to have those, crudely put, my experience has to have those ingredients. So getting to the example of space and time, here's how it would work. Now, scientific knowledge, you know, empirical scientific knowledge deals with space and time. Objects, you know, in space, objects in time. And so to understand how we know the world requires understanding how we can experience objects spatially and temporally. Now, for Kant, space is not an object of experience. He claims, and you know, people would disagree with him on this, obviously, that we don't actually experience space. We don't experience time. Although, if you ever, you know, waiting stuff or suffering through a painful class, perhaps this one, you probably think you're experiencing time. But time really hurts. <laughs> but he takes those to be frames of reference in which the objects appear to us. So we don't actually experience the time or experience the space. It's how we, you know, crudely put, sort of organize and structure our experience. And he calls these forms of intuition. So what is space then? Well, he claims 
we can imagine empty space without objects. It's easy to just imagine emptiness, a whole bunch of empty. This kind of like picture, like, you know, actually what I always picture is just, you know, black rectangle. <laughs> space, nothing. <laughs> there we go. But he claims we can't imagine objects without space. Because if, if I picture objects, I have to picture, you know, space. They're in, well, I think of them as being, we all think of them as being in space. Or even if they fill up the whole thing, they've got to have, like, you know, space. Yeah, it's got to be somewhere. So the spatial qualities are not, you know, qualities and objects of our sensation. They're something else. What he claims is this. We don't actually, like, experience space. We arrange our experiences spatially. So space is a form of our sense because it structures our experiences. So kind of roughly put, we have like a, well, I'll use a really bad, bad analogy. Everyone's heard the expression of seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. We see everything as being, you know, better than it is. And of course, you know, the idea is that the good, you know, the goodness is out of the world, it's in the glasses. And so we see the world, to use my crappy analogy, through space glasses. So the concept of space are in our mind, and we're organizing stuff spatially. Before, and we don't do it consciously. You don't, you don't sit there and like see the thing and like, it's not like you have to wait like when you're watching like Hulu waiting for it to buffer. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> but it does that, you know, very auto automatically. So apparently we've got pretty good processors, so we can do that, you know, instantly. Now what about time? Now time, he claims, is not a thing in the world. So it's not like out there, like a table or a chair, or a kiwi, the bird, or the fruit. It is, according to him, a form in which objects appear to us. It's a form of the inner sense, because, he claims, our mental states, being happy, sad, and knowing it, occur to us of necessity in temporal sequence. Now, one sort of interesting implication in his view is this. In philosophy of religion, one of the classic problems is, and also in theology, how do you reconcile God being like all-knowing and things like prophecy with you know, free will? How can we be free and yet God, you know, know all that's going to happen. And how can there be prophecy of events unless those events are fixed? Because if there was really prophecy that says how things are going to be, there's going to be presumably a way things got to be. Now, so Kant's view provides an interesting way to answer that question. Our experience of time may be unique to us as humans, that we experience not time, we organize experience with our, you know, temporal, you know, concept. But different beings, he claims, may have very different, you know, concepts of time. And in the case of God, the way he sees it, you know, one account of God is that God does not perceive time, well, does not perceive events like we do. You know, we divide things into what has been, what is, and we can't see what will be, but we think of you know that that you know, division, you know, the past, now, the future. And God leaves open the possibility that God, his concept of time, is you can't really say it occurs all at once because that implies time, but there's no separation. So what we consider the past, present, and future, it's all one and the same to to God. And the crappy analogy I use is that. We watch the the movie of reality like we watch, you know, Hulu or Netflix. You know, it's 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 plain, and we we can we we're watching it that way. But what God can do, it's like if you ever use like editing software, you know, we can see like all the the strips. Well, God sees all of that on this view, so He sees and perceives everything. But like here would be you know start of time, if time is beginning, here would be end of time, or if it doesn't, to infinity, and God's got access to all of that. So it's just like, if you were watching a movie, the way we experience it is, you know, we just see that moment playing out on the screen. But if you somehow could access it, you know, the full thing, 
you would you would know how it's going to end, even though you didn't make it end that way. So God would know what we're going to do because we haven't done it yet. But from God's standpoint, we've already done it. We did it here. <laughs> you know, it'd be, I mean, to use a crap analogy, it'd be, like, it'd be like someone saying, "How can you have free will if someone can see what you're you're what you're doing in that world?" Well, you can still have free will, just because they're seeing what you're doing in that room. In this case, the room is the, the future. You haven't done it yet, from your perspective, or from God's perspective, already done it. <laughs> it already been done. <laughs> now, it also leaves it open that other, you know, given Kant's view, other creatures that are different from us, you know, not, not just God, but other creatures, you know, aliens or, you know, intelligent machines, may experience reality very differently. From us, and so what we you know, he's not a as we'll see, he's not a relativist. He doesn't, he doesn't think in the sense that reality is entirely subjective, but we have, we can have very different experiences, which can have you know some, some interesting results, like trying to communicate. You know, imagine if you're talking to a being that perceives reality very very differently. And we have we do have that problem with people. People, like for example, political views. Hmm. Trying to communicate with someone who's very different political views <coughs> is tough. And imagine someone who literally perceived they have different, totally different concepts. Sure. Mm -hmm. I can't talk to this person. <laughs> so what about math? Well, his main purpose of developing the concept of space and time is, oddly enough, to explain how mathematical judgments can be synthetic a priori. Because we Sort of his main deal is he wants to establish there are claims that are synthetic, that is to say they tell us about the world, but are also a priori that are not post-experience but pre-experience. So he wants to know how we can know stuff about the world with certainty and prior to experience. And to get that, he needs the synthetic a priori. Now he thinks the space-time thingy does that. How so? Well, this is what he claims. Geometry is all about space, which is true. I mean, think about it, that's, that's what geometry is. It's just, you know, you've got your x, y, you have three-dimensional space, x, y, and z. So it's spacey stuff. And so if space is a concept that's built in, you know, prior to experience, and geometry is about space, well, it's about something that is a far away, but also something that, as he sees it, is also necessary. So he can tell you about the world and also be certain. Or so he claims. Now what about math? Well, the math one seems kind of perhaps more of a cheat. Because he says, doing math involves time. Which is true. <laughs> you know, because I guess you, you need time to do math. <laughs> but it's true anyway. So, Given the end of time is this you know, a priori concept, et cetera, et cetera, then math falls into time. But you know, some, some critics have said, well, then pretty much anything we do would fall under time as well. But basically, his deal is this. By making math and geometry linked to space and time, and making you know, space and time a priori, then his claim is, is that he gets to have, it tells us about the world, but is prior to experience and also necessary. And he thinks that that succeeds. And of course, critics say, no, no, it doesn't. Now, another important, well, before going to more common stuff, anything about the space time stuff that needs more space or time? Now Kant also brings forth his categories to understand it. Now, like a lot of the dead guys looked at, he likes to talk about the faculties of the mind, like how it works. And of course it's still of interest today if you talk to people, obviously in philosophy, but also things like psychology and education, they're interested in like how that mental stuff works. Kant, like some of our other dead guys, claims that we get our knowledge from, well, some of our knowledge, from two faculties. 
sensibility, which is not like um, it's not like you know being sensible in the sense of you know wearing sensible shoes, but the sense of you know literally the senses. So this would be stuff we get from the senses. And secondly, the understanding. Now he does consider they may come from a common but unknown root. In other words, understanding and sensibility may under underneath that have a common, you know, I guess, system or however you want to describe that. So how do they work? Well, here's this picture. And I'll use a crappy analogy, because all my analogies are always crappy. Think of your camera, you know, you're thinking about your smartphone as being like analogous to you. And you get your camera or your smartphone, and you take a picture. Or you record something. Or you're doing both, you're like Skype. So the sensibility would be like the camera and the microphone on your phone. It brings in the sense data. Then, of course, once you have, you know, you got the image in your, in your phone, in the memory, if you got an iPhone, you can open up like a camera app, or if you've got other apps like a Photoshop app on there, you know, or, or some other, you know, photo manipulation app, you can open it up in that app and do stuff with it. And so, to use my crap analogy, the sensibility, you know, the senses. So that gets us the object. You snap the picture, and you get the picture in your phone. Then the understanding, to use my crap analogy, would be like apps you use to sort of manipulate that, and you can, you know do stuff with it. Now, moving away from my crappy analogy, and basically the way it would work, you know, away from the analogy is you sense stuff, you get stuff in the mind, and then your understanding can, can do stuff with it. And it may do stuff, you know, as Khan said, before you're even really thinking about it, just processes it automatically. Now, we need both for the following reason. If we had no sensibility, we should say senses, We'd have nothing in here. There'd be nothing, to, nothing for the understanding to work with. So in a way, that's kind of similar to what our good dead friends, the empiricists, believed. That you know, prior to experience, you got emptiness in a way. But and of course, without the understanding, merely having the senses wouldn't be enough either. Because then you just have stuff in there, and there'd be no processing. You'd just be begin to deal with the crap my crap analogy. You know, like taking a picture, you know, like you have your camera working, but you have no software on your phone. So you, you take pictures all day, but you can't do anything with them. And so he claims you need to have both. Now, interesting though for Kant, even though the sensibility is needed to get its stuff in there, the mind already has got a lot of stuff preloaded. Namely, all of those, all that a priori stuff. So in a way, he's kind of like, kind of have his, you know, his cake, and eat it too in a way. Because on one hand, you need the sensibility to get objects in there, but on the other hand, there's already a lot of stuff kind of going on in there, you know, in terms of the structure. Now, if someone's doing that stuff, well, that's what he claims. We have concepts. So the understanding, to use a crap, oh, I'll use a really crappy analogy. If you ever used like a you know the iPhone you know photo app, you've got like these you know filters. You have like you know vintage, and you can do like um, you know you change, basically change the you know the, the, you know hue or saturation. But you have some filters in there you can apply them. Here's my crap analogy. Think of those concepts as like those filters that you. But what happens is that there are way the concepts are applied like automatically. It's like the your picture is taken, and your your mind has already done all kinds of pre-processing to it. Um, I guess using another crap analogy, think of like a camera that's got like motion control. So even though the image is you know coming in all kind of jumbled, it's already before you see it like in your, your viewer, it's already kind of stabilized it. And of course, if you're familiar with photography, you can do all kinds of settings and so forth in your camera, and it does all that stuff before you even see the picture. So think of the concepts as like the presets or filters that get applied, you know, before you even see the picture. Now, he regards these concepts as pure, because they're a priori, they're just built in. And to find them, what he does is this. He goes through, you know, our judgments of things, 
and sees what, what we do. Now, his methodology involves the logic of our good dead friend, Aristotle. And he, much like he believed that Newtonian physics was the final physics, which was, you know, kind of close. You know, we only had, you know, quantum physics, and then we'll have, like, more physics, but you, you work with what you get, basically. <laughs> And Newtonian physics works pretty good. As long as you're going slower than the speed of light, it's fine. And we spend most, most of our day, we spend, you know, below the speed of light. So it works pretty well. Yep. Now, again, he also used Aristotle's logic, which he considered to be the final development, which, of course, not the case. But again, a fair question would be is, well, even though he was wrong about that, does that really damage his argument? Well, this is what he claims. He thinks, by examining our experiences, we can deduce, deductively, what concepts we would need to have those judgments. So basically what he's saying is, we have these judgments, therefore, we must have these concepts. And to use my really crappy analogy, it'd be like, suppose you wondered, like, what sort of things the camera was, software was doing to the image before you saw it. Well, the way to do that would be to analyze, you know, the image you've got and figure out, like, what's, you know, what's going on there, what is that, what's it doing, what's happening in there. Now, he claims they're built in, they're a priori. So, again, going my crappy analogy, you don't load them into your camera, they're always, they're always there. And... They're the way the mind represents experience to us. And here they are for They are the 12 a priori concepts. The first step, what, what kind of makes it, um, you might say, well, it's kind of a cheat on the number, because the, um, the sort of groupings, each kind is one. And so do the individual things. I always think of it as kind of like, you know, if you, you, know, you bought donuts and they said, oh, you get 12 donuts, because the third box is kind of, no, oh, you're ripping me off my donuts. But then here they are. First one is quantity. And these include unity, you know, oneness, plurality, manyness, and totality, allness. So you get the one, the many, and the all. Secondly, there's quality, and these include reality, negation, and limitation. And thirdly, modality, which includes the following sort of dichotomies. Possibility, impossibility, you know, what can be, what cannot be, the existence and non-existence, namely, what is, what's not, and lastly, necessity, what must be, and contingency, what could be, but doesn't have to be. And he thinks, or thought, because he's like really dead now, that these are the 12 very primary concepts. This is how we sort out experience. To use my crappy analogy, we'd be like, you know, getting a photo app, and the photo app would say, hey, you know, we got 12 filters. There are filters. And this is, you know, they filter you know, your photos. In this case, they filter our experiences, or so we claims. Now, of course, given his view, this is something you can, you can do yourself. You could go, you know, take experiences and perform this sort of analysis to see if you get what Kant does or if you think he's, he's wrong. Now, interestingly, morally enough, I was heard an uh, interview on NPR about... Um, they were talking to like a, a neuroscientist talking about you know his examination of how we perceive stuff, and he, he was talking about Kant. He said, "Yeah, this is basically you know what Kant said." And I was like, "Yep, yeah, neuroscience, hundred years behind philosophy." Mm -hmm. Actually, they get all the cool toys. We just get we just get to think about stuff. They get all the grants and neuroimaging and so forth. Yeah, philosophy is basically the least paid of the, uh, the things. No toys. Now, 
as I mentioned before, one of the things that you know, Khan was trying to do was respond to Hume. Because he said, you know, Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers. And when he went through Hume, we saw that every time Hume did his Hume thing, it always ends, you can almost picture him sitting there, you know, at his desk working really intently, and the end, you know, getting more and more frustrated in the end, just throwing away his, you know, throwing his pen or his quill and his book saying, darn it, I know nothing. Let me go down to get a beer. <laughs> you see him at the other bar drinking until he's like happy and playing pool with his friends. But, you know, he laid out this, this skepticism. What's the problem? Well, first problem is this. Hume, you know, brought forth that dichotomy. You get relations of ideas that are certain but tell you nothing about the world. So you can know that a bachelor is an unmarried man and vice versa, but of course that doesn't tell you whether the person is married or not. You can know triangles have three sides, but you don't know if there's a tri triangle in Alaska or not. All we've got according to him is unconnected impressions, you know, perceptions. You know, and even our own identity, according to Hume, is just a bunch of perceptions. And he says, ah, oh, that's hell, that's all grammar too. You know, time to get another beer. Now, his view about causation, as we saw, was again habituation. You never see the causal connection, it's just A happens, B happens, happens enough, you say A is followed by B. And so he ends up saying you can't know anything, causation is just habituation, and so you end up in this mess. Now again, but Hume was pragmatic about it. He said, yeah, you know, you really think about it, you can't trust the senses, can't trust causation, identity is just a matter of grammar. But he says, you know, when you're down drinking beer and playing pool with your friends, you don't care. <laughs> it's a pragmatic solution. But, presumably because Kant didn't drink, <laughs> as far as you know, he needed something better than, don't worry about it, go get a beer, play some pool. So Kant tries to solve the problem. And here's how he tries to make that happen. What he's going to try to do is get substance and some causation. So here's how it works with substance thing. Now, one thing we saw talking about all these dead guys is people like Locke and Descartes, they accepted with varying degrees of reluctance or you know, happiness, substance. And the basic idea, as you recall, is that a substance is like, well, well, one way to look at it is, in the strict sense, it's something that can exist entirely on its own, which as Spinoza argued, that can only be God. You know, it's going to be the one thing. And then people like Descartes took it as like a, crudely put like a single object, something that can exist by itself. This is distinct from the qualities. So like the camera bag can exist, you know, by itself. You know? But I couldn't pull off like the color and have a handful of the color. I can't, you know, pull off the shape and have some shape. I can't pull off, you know, some volume or density. And so everything, all these things are bound together. And so Locke said, oh, there's going to be, you know, reluctantly said, there's going to be substance, something I don't know what, that holds all this stuff together. And Kant, um, sorry, Hume, looked at it and said, you know, take the case of, you know, immaterial substance, the soul. You see, he was looking for it, just by the perceptions. He doesn't see the substance holding it together. And so given being in Paris, he says, yeah, you can't experience it, not there. So what does Kant do? Well, Kant says this. He agrees with Hume, you know, we can't, we don't see substance. But he claims we need the category of substance in order to order qualities into objects. So the way the camera case, the way we experience a camera case is as a, we don't experience substance, our concept of substance orders it. We take the qualities, you know, shape, volume, density, mass, coloration, etc., and we order them together, and we get an object, you know, camera case. And so, it's not for him an underlying metaphysical reality. So, if you ask Kant, you know, when he's alive, is there a mysterious metaphysical substance? You have to say, hell, I don't know. <laughs> Do you have like another example of that? Oh, for the substance thing? Mm -hmm. um, this is when I come with a crappy analogy. Um, here's one that's really, really a bad analogy, but maybe it will work. Think about um, 
Imagine um, if we didn't have the concept of substance, we wouldn't be able to conceive of things being like a single thing. We wouldn't be able to like so, yeah, put them together. Mm -hmm. Here's like a crappy one than a slightly less crappy one. Total crappy one would be something like imagine just a big um, pile of Legos on the floor, and that's you know it wouldn't be anything. It'd be a big pile of, pile of stuff. And what the what our category of substance does is allows us to form them into groups. Another example would be, this is probably a better one, imagine if you couldn't tell where one thing ended and another thing began. So like we looked at like a, I mean like a you know, person, and you, you couldn't tell like what was clothing and what was person. You know, so you, and I mean, it's, it's, you can imagine, um, in a way, like kids may be having that kind of problem. You know, because if they don't, you know, when they first see stuff, they may not be sure like what is. They would be confused. I mean, you can imagine someone being, you know, confused by hats. Like, oh, the person took their top of their head off or something. And so what we do is when you take like a person, you know, and you you organize them. Like, okay, hat. There's a person, hat, glasses, yeah, backpack, desk. It's not all one thing. So you're able to separate things into distinct entities. I get it. And basically sort out the the parts. I mean, to use, a, to use a crappy computer analogy, it's kind of like um, when you're working with um, like a graphics program, and oh no, a better example. You, when you were a kid, did you ever have like the paper dolls where you, you'd cut them out and you'd take, you have like, um, you know, paper clothing you put on them and so forth? I had Barbies. Well, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying, yeah. Just say, yeah. Just say, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so the idea would be is you'd have, um, it's kind of like the difference between having like a, like a picture of a doll where you can't take any pieces off, and the, doing the substance thing is you're kind of able to organize them into pieces, like which part is the doll, mm -hmm. and which part of like the, the paper clip, or just taking a Barbie doll, which, which where is the Barbie doll, and what are the parts that come off. Because there are some dolls that are like, or action figures that are all one thing. You can't take, like the yeah. clothing is just built onto them, so you can't, it's, you can't take them off. And so, and others have, you know, removable stuff. So, you think of that as kind of conceptually, that we form the concept of like, like the way, like, the doll or the action figure, the, you know, the parts about make it up. So we divide stuff up. And Kant believes that we all, all as human beings, we all kind of do that the same way. So we don't think that, like, hats are parts of people's heads. But we can imagine, you know, um, like, for example, in science fiction, Sometimes the way they try to make aliens seem more alien is they don't get concepts like clothing. They think of like, I remember um, many stories I've read where we have aliens who don't wear clothing and they see humans and they describe them as like they have removable skins. Because from their standpoint, they don't, they don't know that clothing is you know, clothing. And so they see like the human, you know, putting on, you know, removing the helmet. They think the human's got like two heads and they're pulling off like one of their heads. So they a different concept of, of stuff. Yeah, so the substance, the notion of substance is how we make objects into unities. And he claims that we do that uh, automatically. Now, we can be wrong about it, because we can get things wrong about like what's a single thing. I mean, it's easy to imagine like kids um, not knowing like what's part of something. And of course, we can easily be confused sometimes ourselves, like if you have, again, like an action figure. You may go to like take a piece off, and it's like, oh, you know, it's not removable. It's just molded right, right in there. So a substance, he says, built in. We don't see substance. We just automatically, you know, do apply that, and make it, you. Know, to use a final crap analogy, it's kind of like if you. It's like scanning something. If you ever use like a scanner to scan in like a document to get to converge a text, the you know, optical character recognition. So we kind of do that. We you know, scan it in a way. And sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't get it quite right. And sometimes it's embarrassing that we're wrong. <laughs> I once had a program, I think it was on, it, was like, it seemed like it was set to, to obscenity. Can I like, always scan stuff? It's like, no, don't translate it that way. <laughs> so I learned to check in before sending anything to people to weed out all the, because uh, it doesn't know. Or maybe it did know. It was just a vulgar, obscene sort of machine. <laughs> now, the next thing he considers is the important notion of causation. 
Now, Hume was a song, it was all habituation. You experience, you know, one thing followed by another. It happens over and over again. You expect, you know, you put the popcorn in the microwave, it pops. Do it over and over again, you expect it'll happen the next time. But as Hume said, no matter how much we gaze upon it, we never see the, the causation, never see the connection. Now, what Kant does is this. He thinks that there are what he calls contingent a posteriori truths. Things that are true, but we only know from experience, and they're not always true. You know, the contingent. And for what he calls the synthetic a priori truths. Things that are true always must be true, and are true about the world. Now, he claims that cause and effect is one of those relations that if there is real, well, actually we really can't, we really can't say real, but if we get it right, then there is necessary causation. So what he's trying to do, basically, you know, roughly put, is enable science to work. So for science to be, you know, to have confidence in science, it can't be just, hey, this has happened, like, I did it a bunch of times, it happened a bunch of times, probably happened next. We want more than that. Like, if you imagine if you're taking a physics class, the professor says, you know, well, here's a formula. Uh, we've done this, you know, lots of times, and it has worked this way so far, but next time, hey, who knows? It may just blow up and kill everybody. <laughs> Which, of course, you know, you think, well, that's, we need something a little better than that. And he would do is that's the best we can get. Now, Kant does believe we can be mistaken. We can mistake, we can obviously mistake accidental conjunctions, correlations for causation. You can get it wrong. But, he thinks, we always organize things in terms of cause and effect. Now, of course, it does create a bit of a kind of tension there because you know, he thinks the cause and effect thing is a concept you know, built into us, but we can get things right or wrong, so that seems to be about the, the world. Because, you know, a right cause and effect would get the world right. But if cause and effect is our concept, that creates a bit of a problem. Now, one of the things, of course, is we've seen with you know, a lot of the dead guys is the sub subjective, objective, you know, problem. And we saw this with, like, um, well, Barclay. He runs the problem of, you know, if everything's an idea in your mind, then how do we separate, you know, hallucinations and dreams from, you know, real stuff? And Kant runs into this kind of problem as well, because on the one hand, you know, for Kant, all these concepts are in, your, in the mind. And he, he says, you know, they can be very different from different beings. So we, what you might be tempted to say is, well, it's all subjective. You know, our experiences are all subjective. It's all in our, well, big chunks of it are in our, in our head. To use like a, I use a, you know, use a fairly standard example. It's kind of like if you look at like patterns on the floor or clouds. You might see like a, I think you see like a bunny in the cloud or a tree. But of course, you know, you could say in a way there's not really a bunny or a tree there. And so the question would be is, isn't all the stuff we're experiencing just subjective, just in our head? Now Kant doesn't want to say you know, hey, it's all in your head. He wants it to be objective as well. So how does he make that work? Well, this is what he claims. Subjective experience, subjective experience of two qualities. One, they lack consistency, and they're not interpersonal. Objective ones are consistent, ordered by rules, and interpersonal. For example, what's the difference between pink elephants and actual elephants? Well, the usual answer is, the way you tell is, well, how do you tell if you're hallucinating or not? Something seems odd. Yeah, it may seem odd. And you ask people, hey, do you see that? And no one else sees it. Now, of course, there's a problem, maybe you're hallucinating those people, too. Yeah. <laughs> but generally, kind of the test is, you, know, you ask them, the usual thing is you ask people, well, do, you, do you see that? And if they do, and they're not, and you don't think they're hallucinations, then it's probably real. And of course, hallucinations and dreams tend to be inconsistent. So kind of the test is, are the people experiencing it? Is it consistent, etc.? Now, the example 
to use a crap analogy, one example we can kind of use is, um, well, color. You know, we know, you know, color is not out there in the world, it's in our mind. But we think color is like an objective thing in a way, because the way it works is because we can all agree like what color stuff is. And if someone sees it differently, we can figure out, okay, they're color, color blind. And so even though color is all in our head, you can see it's not entirely subjective. And so he thinks that that handles that. Now again, one of the interesting problems he does, does run into is that, in a way, the objectivity is kind of between us. That even though it's all in our minds, our minds work the same way. Again, the color is a pretty good analogy. We say like, okay, we know color is all in the head, but we all, we all say that, that it's that, that color. You know, this is gray. This is steel. This is <laughs> not really, not quite yellow, not quite green, so it's grello. And he notes that like other beings, may have their experience would be very different from ours. And so objectivities may be, you know, species relative in a way. So how does this experience stuff work? Now, we disagree with Hume that by themselves, each experience is distinct and last, they lacks a necessary connection. Experience is unified, but not by the sense data, and we don't experience the unity. Basically, the mind unifies it. Again, to use my crappy analogy, the experiences are like a bunch of Lego blocks just being dumped into your, your mind, into your room. And then what are, what's done, our understanding, well, in a way, it's, to use a crap analogy, it's kind of like you can imagine the mind is kind of like, it's got like two rooms. There's like one room where the Lego blocks are dumped in, and there's like the first room crew that assembles it into you know, an object, and then tosses it into the second room where you, are, where you perceive it. And so before you, you're not even aware of it, your categories are doing all that stuff. Again, going the crap analogy of the camera, before you, you know, look at the, before it gets to, to the screen, it goes through all this processing that you're not, not aware of. Likewise, when you're, you know, hearing, hearing my voice or seeing stuff, it's already pre, pre-processed. Kind of like processed food. <laughs> so ideas are like Cheetos in your mind. Now, so how do we do this stuff? Well, he lays forth what he calls, well, these various, these three types of synthesis. And they are synthesis of apprehension and, intu and intuition. Excuse me. Synthesis of reproduction and imagination. And synthesis of recognition and a concept. So, these are basically ways we unify and organize our experience. So what are these three things and what the heck do they mean? Well, first one is this. The synthesis <coughs> excuse me, of apprehension and intuition works like this. This is to distinguish elements of experience from other elements and take them as one experience. For example, imagine, we'll use the example of a song. You can pick any song you want, perhaps a Katy Perry song. So he rides her Rebecca <laughs> Lane out on the stage to conquer the world. Be a good movie. Katy Perry conquers the world with Rebecca Lane. People would pay to see it. Michael Bay likes it. It'd make a lot of money. It'd be big in China. I need to copyright that. Or trademark it or something. I'll share it with Katy Perry because it's her, her and her Rebecca Lane. Now, this would work like this. You get a song to play, say a Katy Perry song. And using this, Synthesis of apprehension and intuition, what we do, at least according to Kant, is we distinguish the notes. We pick out a series of notes from a variety of noises and recognize it as a song. Well, you can take a concrete example. Suppose, you know, a, uh, somebody's ringtone goes off playing Katy Perry or the Frozen people. Let it go, let it go. <laughs> and there's all kinds of noises going on. What, you, what we can do, we're pretty good at this, we can pick out 
that particular you know song out of all the other noises that are that are happening. And I mean, if you ever been to like a club where it's really loud, and you can pick out, you can kind of selectively you know to focus on the person you're talking to, or if they're boring, switch to music, <laughs> and we can do this. Or like we watch TV, you can kind of do that. So it's that ability in a way. We're able to focus on you know picking out one element of the experience. This you know the song the, the song out of all the other noise. And we're we're not like super great at it. Could we can be overwhelmed, but we're actually pretty good. And some people are really good. They can be like in a club with you know, all kinds of stuff going on. They can filter out that stuff. Or you can filter out people talking. You want to focus on the big game. You know, hear, hear things being said. Second thing, synthesis of reproduction in imagination. This is to remember the elements in experience by the use of imagination and order the experience. For example, to take the example of the song, to remember there was a, to know there's a second note, you got to remember there was a first note, and so we got to remember the the parts. You know, basically, you know, like counting stuff, and that's something we do do as well. Third, the synthesis of recognition in a concept. This is to regard the experience as a unified whole. And again, going with our song example, this would be recognizing that entity as a song. This is, you know, it's accurate because, you know, it's kind of what we do. I don't know if we do it like the way Kant claims, but we do know that. We're able to pull out particular sounds, like a, you know, like a song. We're able to know, like, the order of, say, the notes. And we're able to recognize that as a single entity, a so we're able to organize and sort reality. And we do it pretty pretty well. So we get the empirical concepts from our experience. These concepts though require the a priori concepts he claims, like you know, plurality, totality, causality, etc. And the mind, without you know us being actively aware of this we synthesize those elements of experience and unify them. So, going back to the whole Copernican revolution, the objects conform to our mind. What the mind does through its categories is organizes, divides, unifies everything, creating the experiences we get. So, essentially, the mind is, you know, to use the, the phone or computer analogy, the stuff comes in, and it's processed. You know, it's when we get, you know, we, you walk into a room and instantly you think, you know, there are, you know, five people, lots of desks. You separate the desks from the walls. You can sort out the noises and that's all being, being done. You, you don't even think about how it's being, being done. And the only time we have to kind of like sit, you know, concentrate is when things are kind of muddled. I mean, I always think of, for example, like, um, like on the Ghost Hunter show or something, or like crime scenes, you know, or like when they're trying to separate like out of noise. Because everything's kind of blurred together, you might actually have to concentrate to like figure out like what is being being said, or if anything's being said at all. But in general, we do it just sort of automatically, just, you know, instantaneous processing. So that's his theory of knowledge stuff. Now he thinks that we get the necessity stuff in all that pre-processing. The built-in air are the necessary components that unify, divide, organize our experience. And he thinks this solves the problem of science. That now, as long as we accept his view, we can be confident about science. We can accept causality, space, time, and substance. Not as things, but as categories. And of course, not everyone buys that, because otherwise people would just say, that kind of got it right, you know, philosophy, done. We now segue into his metaphysics. Before we get into metaphysical, though, what do you think about the previous stuff that needs more stuff? Now, whether a good dead, dead friend Hume 
despite being an author, Hume said, you know, if you get like a book and all it's got in it is metaphysics, throw that sucker in the fire. I don't, I don't know if he was, I don't think he was really too serious about that, but that's what he claimed. And one of Kant's objectives was to handle the problem in metaphysics. And he thinks that just because there's been bad metaphysics, that throwing away metaphysics because there's been some bad metaphysics, would be like refusing to breathe air because there's some bad air. So how does he try to save that metaphysics? Well, Kant presents two concepts, the phenomena and the noumena. And here's the distinction, roughly put, then we'll get into some more detail. The phenomena is what we experience. So, this, <laughs> I don't know, I'm phenomena, <laughs> you're phenomena too. The noumena is what's really real, beyond, behind the experience. Now, not surprisingly, this is what, uh, you know, philosophers talk about, you know, people like Kasumi, Descartes, Locke, etc. say, this is what we experience, and then this is what's really real behind that. And one of the questions is, you know, we saw in our good for Descartes, is there anything really real for real behind our, our experiences, or is it just in our mind? Now, Kant believed he established to his satisfaction that you could have synthetic a priori judgments in math and physics. That math and physics is certain, but most importantly, it tells you about the world. It is, I mean, this is still also a debate today. There's the question of when you do all those, you know, equations. Physicists work on all those equations for dark matter, dark energy, black holes, you know, alternative universes. Does that actually prove that stuff exists, or do you have to go and like confirm it by looking? And most scientists tend to say, well, you kind of get to confirm it. You know, you get to get some empirical proof. But there are some things that, of course. By definition, you, you probably will, you couldn't experience like alternative universes, unless you allow like they do in the comic books or in sci-fi, where like you could have people coming over from the, you know, like in um, you know Doctor Who, or like in um, DC. I mean, DC has like the infinite universes, yeah. and people are always, people are always popping in from from next door, causing causing trouble. But the, you know, unless people do that, unless like counterpart, counterpart you, who's like a supervillain, shows up and takes over the world, it's like, that's cool, that's what I do as a supervillain. Why do I have to destroy the world? That's where I keep my stuff. Now, but his question is here, can you do the same thing with metaphysics? They did with physics and math. Can we know about what lies beyond, you know, experience with certainty? Now, like the empiricist, he thinks, uh, no, very unlikely. What we have to do, the way he sees it essentially is this. What we know about the world is limited to our concepts and categories. Essentially, limited by the space and time categories. So what lies beyond those is not comprehensible to us. I mean, the sort of analogy I often use is there's a um, oh, famous uh, horror writer, H.P. Lovecraft. He's the guy that created, you know, Cthulhu and the big octopus guy that showed up on South Park. And that, that was kind of, that's when just Cthulhu would jump the show. And he had this, this kind of notion, one thing that he kind of brought forth, although kind of working with a, a writer called Arthur um, Machen, or Machen, who wrote a book called The Great God of Pan. And he put forth this idea that there are things that are beyond our categories of understanding. And if we were to experience in them, it would shatter our minds. You know, book, you know, there'd be things like books that would reveal truths beyond our capacity to handle, or things, we'd see things that would be beyond our capacity to contain. And so I was going to, when I read Kant, I was kind of thinking about that. You know, would metaphysics be like that? Something that either we just can't see, because it's beyond our, our experience, or we just, just wouldn't be able to experience it or, or grasp it, or in a way more cool, but more horrifyingly, would it like shatter, you know, the mind? You can see the truth, but you'd go mad seeing it. Or to use a, you know, another crappy analogy, uh, an author, uh, Ambrose Bierce, wrote an interesting story called The Damned Thing. And 
it was like about this invisible monster that was plaguing someone, but it had an interesting notion of invisibility. The creature was a color we couldn't see. So it wasn't invisible in the sense that light passed through it, we just couldn't see that color, which is an interesting, kind of interesting idea. So perhaps there would be, you know, just like going with that idea of colors we can't see, perhaps there would be, you know, we can't perceive reality because we, we just, like with the color, we just can't see the true, the really real for real beyond that. But he thinks we really, really want to see that stuff. And he calls traditional metaphysics transcendent illusions. Now again, he breaks it into two categories, the phenomena and noumena, which are kind of fun to say. Noumena. Give it an interesting name for something. Or maybe, or actually it sounds kind of like a, kind of like a coffee Starbucks would serve. Noumena latte, an extra phenomenon. <laughs> So what's the phenomenon? Well, metaphysics, you know, we saw like Descartes and Mach involved a dichotomy. There's our ideas, and then there's what's really real for real. The stuff out there, the stuff in here. And this, of course, gives us the problem that's the subject of, you know, the paper. Namely, the problem of the external world. How do you know what's in here matches what's out there? Now, a common solution is this. The only world that makes sense to us is the world of objects that appear in our experience. And this is the phenomenon. This is how things appear to be. So in practical terms, the phenomenal world is the real world. And the idea that it corresponds to an external reality is unintelligible. So in a way, he's, you might say, hey, <laughs> that sounds like our good dead friend George Barker. You know, the world you experience is the real world. And it doesn't even make sense to talk about there being, you know, yeah, something beyond that. What you see is what you, what you do. Now at this point, of course, you could just, you might say, well, you probably just stop there. Phenomenal. But he probably thought, well, Barclay's kind of crazy. I don't want to be that kind of crazy. So he talks about the numina. The numina is this. For whatever reason, we just want to talk about what's beyond experience. We're, we're not satisfied with saying, okay, this is the world as it seems to us. We always want to ask, but what, what's really real for real beyond that? What lies beyond you know, the veil? So the numino are the things really real for real. They are what is really out there. If we were to, well, if we were to take away all of our categories, and somehow we're able to see reality, truly real for real as it, as it is, to tear away all our illusions. And again, that, that notion is often kind of a theme in either like in horror, where like you, you know, again, like in Lovecraft and other, you know, to see the world as it truly is and just destroy your mind. And there's also the like, oh, in a nicer vein, the idea of like in, in enlightenment, where you strip away all the illusions and you see the, the true, the truly real for real. Like in Plato, you see the really real for, for real. And it has a good effect as opposed to going, you know, crazy. Now, that is what the new one is supposed to be. Hey, but here's the problem. Can we actually do that? Can we perceive what is really real for real without any of our interpretations or categories. We don't seem to do that. Unless the people went crazy or it got super light or something. Yeah, so we can't say, according to, to Kant, we can't really give a positive description. All we can say is conceptual. We can say whatever it is that's really real for real, that if we were to somehow able to like remove all our conceptual, you know, overlay and input, then it would be that. It would be what's really real for real out there. Or like, um, like with, um, it'd be like the raw image in, you know, in the camera, in a way. It'd be if you could take away all the processing and just have the real thing, somehow. And Kant thinks, you know, you can't do that. Now Kant, he doesn't want to give up the, the new one. 
he does retain the idea that there's a world out there beyond our experience. Why? Well, because he doesn't want to say that we just create our experiences all in our mind, because that would be you know phenomenal, phenomenology. It's all in your mind, or in the solipsism. It's just you in your mind. So he thinks what's going on in our minds has some connection to what's out there. They're really real for real. And his reference, the way he describes phenomena, seems to suggest that they're connected to the new moon. But the problem is, of course, one of our categories is causation. But causation is basically what we put on our, you know, it's, it's not out there, it's a concept we use to organize stuff. So given is the way stuff works, we can't apply the concept of causation to what's beyond our experience. It only applies to our experience. So we can't, well, we can say, <laughs> phenomena of noumena cause phenomena, but we really can't say that, given this view. Because we have to experience what's beyond our experience, and we can't do that. So we end up in a bit of a, we end up in a dilemma. If phenomena are caused by the noumena, you know, representation of realism, then it goes against his theory of knowledge. We somehow know something we can't know, given his theory. If we deny this, then we have no idea how they're related. We'd end up with, you know, possibly just being like Barclay. It's all in our, our minds. So that seems to be a problem he, he wasn't able to fix, because he, he seemed, I mean, in a way, he's kind of awesome. He's like, hey, we can't really say anything about Numina, but man, that stuff's irresistible. Like, it's kind of like with Cheetos. You know, you shouldn't be eating that stuff, but somehow you, keep, you just keep shoveling it in. Now, continuing with our transcendent illusions, so what are some of these illusions that we find so cheetah-like, so seductive? Well, he calls these the transcendent illusions of metaphysics. Now, in addition to our sensibility, you know, the senses, and our understanding, he says we have a third faculty, namely reason. And again, one of his big books was the critique of pure reason. Now, we use logic well, logic for him is the use of reason to order and unify the products of the understanding. And he thinks, and again, the critique of pure reason, he's talking about pure reason, he thinks it generates its own concepts which reference what transcends all experience. So what are these transcendental ideas? Well, there are three. You know, because three is a good number. Self, cosmos, and God. Now the problem is this. Given his you know, view about how we're, you know, these concepts, reason mistakenly applies the categories of an understanding beyond their proper board. In other words, we try to take how we, you know, categorize the phenomena, and reason tries to apply it to the new to extend it beyond. Now, what occurs is the following problem. If we use pure reason to go beyond experience and engage in what we consider speculative metaphysics about the noumena, paradoxes and illusions arise, the transcendent illusions. Now, we'll look at the first one, and then that'll bring us to the end of stuff. The first one, which we'll begin looking at now, is the self. Now, we saw in our good dead friend Descartes and others the idea that there is a self, a soul, an enduring non-physical substance. And, you know, basically it's, you know, Descartes' view. Thoughts and experience don't just, like, drift around. You can't, like, bump into a thought or step into anger or trip over sadness. So the idea is, just like with a physical object, you know, the quality is sort of like stuck in the substance. The mind, you know, is a substance that contains all that mental stuff. And without the synthesizing activity of the self, 
we couldn't have unified experiences. So we have this notion, this notion of the noumenal self. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. When you looked at uh, Hume, Hume had the view, you know, if you go inside and poke around in the self, all you find is perceptions, one perception after another, and nothing but perceptions. And so we have experience, but we never experience the self having the experiences. So empirically, we end up where Hume, Hume did. I have all these perception, 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 more perceptions, more perceptions. I don't find the self. There is no self. It's all grammar. Time for another reader. But Kant claims the self is a necessary condition for experience. So what he does is he breaks the self into the empirical self and the transcendental self. What's the difference? You know, stay tuned for our next exciting episode, Adventures in the Self. So, be sure to, uh, if you haven't done the paper yet and want to get the full credit, be sure to upload it to uh, Blackboard by end of day today. If um, 